Most of what makes a person quote unquote good at investing is not only extremely boring and easy to do, but it's also going against basically all of human psychology. I think a lot of people have a tendency to feel that they only need to start taking their money seriously once they have a bunch of it, and that is the exact opposite mentality of what will help you. I was about as irresponsible as a person can be with money, and um, around uh, the time I started TFD, I was like, okay, enough of that. Time to uh, not live this way anymore. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Plain Bagel Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Coffin. We are back again with another finance YouTuber guest. Uh, today, I'm joined by the Chelsea Fagan of The Financial Diet. Chelsea has been one of the sort of OGs, if I can call it that, of, of the finance space on YouTube. I think you started your channel back in 2015, which is kind of before the big rush we had in the finance space. Um, and she has made a bunch of different media outlets, if you want to call it that, around the Financial Diet brand, including the Financial Confessions podcast, a blog with thousands of articles, a newsletter, and of course, the YouTube channel, which focuses on discussing money and sharing money lessons with a female target audience that tends to be uh, the focus group, if you will. Uh, so Chelsea, thank you for taking the time to join us today and, and chat about what we chat about here. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. So I guess for anyone who hasn't run into the financial diet, it is one of the bigger channels. So truly, if you have searched money stuff in the YouTube space, you've probably come across a financial diet video before. But for anyone who might not have heard of your channel before, could you give a bit of a, a background in terms of what kind of content you cover and also maybe what got you interested into posting about money on YouTube? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, The Financial Diet, uh, we do cover a lot of different media we are on YouTube, but we also have a newsletter. We do quite a lot of events and classes. We're on social media. We have a book. So we cover um, pretty much the full gamut of financial issues, financial education, cultural commentary with a financial bent. Um, on YouTube in particular, we have a few weekly shows that kind of cover finance from a few different topics. Um, we're all women. Our office is actually in New York. I'm currently in South Florida, but we're based out of New York and we're 100% women on our staff. Um, and our audience is mostly women, although we do have some boys hanging out in our comment section. We love our boys. We don't have that many of them, but I assume your audience might be more boys than not. So you guys are welcome mm -hmm. to come over. Um, but so we do often talk uh, specifically through the prism of women as it relates to finance, because most women, generally speaking, and when you talk about gender, you really have to speak in pretty big generalities. But for the most part, uh, women, girls and families are not really raised with a ton of um, financial you know, skills and are often not treated as the person who's going to be taking their finances seriously when they eventually statistically end up in a heterosexual uh, marriage or life pairing. So most women, even when they earn more, even when they're more educated, they typically don't have those longer term financial skills um, and have that kind of baggage from kind of growing up without being taught it. And for me, the things that brought me into finance um, I really destroyed my financial life pretty completely at the age of, between the ages of like 18 and 22. I, wow, um, no kidding. In, <laughs> no kidding. I was in big credit card debt. I was in all kinds of default. I had all kinds of unpaid bills and speeding violation tickets. I ended up getting arrested for stuff, you know, kind of linked to that. I got fired from every job I had. Like I was about as irresponsible as a person can be with money. And um, around uh, the time I started TFD, I was like, okay, enough of that. Time to uh, not live this way anymore. <laughs> no kidding. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> I, hadn't, I was not aware of that at all. <laughs> uh, so I guess, uh, aside from just kind of getting things in order, what made you take kind of the jump into posting videos about money? Obviously, it, uh, there must have been some, you know, teaching yourself about money and things like that. What was it that got you broadcasting that to others, if you will? Yeah, so I actually started The Financial Diet as my own personal blog to hold myself accountable because I had a decent sized following on the internet prior to, to starting it um, from working at other media companies um, and publishing uh, work and books elsewhere. Um, so I started it as that Tumblr and that very quickly uh, got the attention of John and Hank Green who are pretty prolific YouTube creators with mm. a huge network of channels. Um, and Hank and I kind of became friends and we're still, you know, 
uh, you know, friends to this day and, and collaborate a lot still, but he at that time in 2015 was, you know, in his kind of portfolio of educational channels, uh, was like, there's a real absence of finance oriented content in what we do. And I really love, you know, at the time it was a Tumblr, your Tumblr. Um, I'd love to make this into a YouTube channel. So for the first two to three years of production, we actually were uh, co-produced with um, Complexly, which is Hank and John Green's company. And then since then, for the past several years, we've been independent. No kidding. So, uh, and I actually, I was going to mention that is, is you've kind of done a, a whole range of videos on the channel, ranging from, you know, discussions of kind of cryptos and NFTs to basic money stuff. And I noticed recently you had a, a collaboration with Hank Green on, on your channel. Uh, but I didn't know he had kind of had early uh, uh, roots with the channel. So, so you mentioned that you're, the majority of your audience is uh, female. It's, it's interesting because it's the exact polar opposite on my channel. It's about 90% male on, on my side. So I'm not sure if it's kind of the same breakdown on your end, but the flip side of it. Um, mm -hmm. But I was just curious if, you know, when it comes to uh, gender and finances, what do you think are those forces at play that have caused that disparity that we see? Because it's, it's not only, you know, the fact that people might not necessarily, you know, be exposed to the same financial lessons, if you will, or the same information. You also see it in, in the industry. I mean, aside, even though the financial services industry is roughly 50-50, when you get higher up to different positions, and especially within asset management, which is the area I tend to focus on, there's a huge disparity there with, uh, with gender. So I, I was curious if you could talk, I, I'm sure it's the subject you've dived into a lot of, but I, I'd like to, for my own viewers, I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, you know, I think uh, whether it pertains to long-term financial management in personal lives, and I think we need to be clear that women typically do make the decisions in a household around things like consumer choices, day-to-day -day budgeting, you know, balancing the checkbook, that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, but men statistically still pretty overwhelmingly manage the longer term finances, retirement, you know, uh, investments, things like that. And in fact, uh, I don't know if it's still a majority, but it's almost certainly at least a plurality. Women in heterosexual marriages um, don't uh, manage their own long term finances until case of divorce or death of a spouse. That's not in mm. all, but it's in a huge number of them. And again, this is across this is across class lines, this is across earning, this is even when the woman earns more or has higher levels of education. Hmm. Um, and then when you look at the professional sphere, as you put it, you know, you see a lot of those same disparities. Now, I do think in both cases, there are a lot of similarities. And I, I will say, you know, I'm certainly, listen, I'm not a, a gender scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to break down biological differences between the sexes. I know that, you know, there are always going to be nature versus nurture arguments when it comes to aptitudes and things like that. However, I think in the case of um, managing finances, because unlike other, you know, there are certain, whether it's um, professions or skill sets or activities, hobbies, sports, whatever it might be, that women are disproportionately underrepresented, that you can maybe make the argument that just women are naturally less inclined to do those things. But when it comes to money in particular, not only do all women to some extent have to deal with money, it's not like we're exempt from that sure. for <laughs> the vast, yeah. vast majority of us, but also women do manage money in a very short term sense and are in fact overwhelmingly sort of like given that role in most household uh, financial systems, which which is actually in many ways the most powerful role in the sense that the day-to-day -day consumer choices are what ultimately dictate most people's you know, budgets and, and therefore their longer-term finances. I think the issue that you see with longer-term finances as it pertains to women is a question of self-fulfilling prophecy. Women from a very young age, girls, are not raised with this knowledge. They're often either explicitly or implicitly told by their families that their future spouse is going to be the one to manage these things. Um, they're sort of, you know, steered toward other things. I'm sure it's not in vogue anymore, but when I was in middle school, we still did home ec where like the girls, you know, the guys would be in wood shop and the girls would be like learning how to, hmm. you know, scramble an egg and balance a checkbook, you know, right. or like do a grocery list. Um, so from a very young age, we're kind of steered into a very, very particular and narrow definition of what financial management means and really sort of not given the skills or the confidence to, to manage these things um, 
ourselves. And on the flip side of this, because I do think it's important to say that although women are negatively impacted by the um, being left out of the financial conversation, which therefore manifests in us being underrepresented and sort of underestimating ourselves, men are really negatively impacted by it too, in the sense that men are, I think, very much overly assessed by, judged by um, their own financial situation, how much mm. they earn, how well they can manage money, you know, even things like, you know, investments in the gamification of money. This is hugely attached to um, men's social value, sense of self, all of these things. So we often find in, for example, heterosexual pairings where the woman is um, the dominant party financially, um, is earning more, is managing the longer term finances. These are also couples who tend to divorce more. They tend to have more problems. Problems. Um, and I don't think it's anything innate with those couples. I think it's that society has created an extremely binary picture of what heterosexual financial management looks like and what gender roles look like within money. And if you are violating those gender roles, it's really hard to overcome that. Yeah, it's almost like a, a cultural inertia, if you will. Like if, if you think mm -hmm. about where, you know, where we would have been in the earlier 1900s where, you know, traditionally speaking, women were told not to deal with money. <laughs> like it was the man's right. job, if you will, and, and kind of the lingering effects that mm -hmm. has. I think the interesting thing too is a lot of studies have shown that uh, when it comes to, uh, and you kind of touched on the gender differences and stuff, when it comes to money management, there's quite a benefit to increasing the diversity there, uh, you know, away from uh, the white male led funds, if you will, because there have been studies that show that when you increase the diversity and, and even when you have female led funds, uh, there are some figures that show that they actually do tend to perform better. And it usually just comes down to the concept of unconventional or different ideas, you know, the avoiding echo chambers and things like that. So it's not just to say that, you know, oh, we should get the area more diversified because it, you know, it's, it's good, obviously, but on top of that, it's like there's an actual tangible benefit to, to doing that, uh, which is why I, I've always had your channel top of mind as, as one I, I'd like to talk to, because it, it's something that, uh, you know, early on in finance, obviously a channel I came across multiple times and uh, really one of the few to be doing that, to be focusing on that target audience. Um, do you find that when it comes to YouTube, do you find that most finance content is still targeting a male audience or do you think it's improved, I guess? Um, you know, it's difficult to say. I mean, audiences do to some extent tend to be self-sorting and I think, you know, we never explicitly started our channel, for example, to be a women's channel. Women just kind of gravitated toward it and as you respond to the audience that you have and you cater toward them, that's going to, you know, uh, mm -hmm. engender more of the same audience, no pun intended. Um, but I think, you know, the, the content that seems very aggressively targeted toward men, I think, especially in the past few years that I've noticed on the internet, because I think good financial education, and I can think of many channels like yours that are um, what I would consider very sound, thoughtful, kind of value neutral, um, conservative in the non-political sense. Um, mm -hmm advice, whether or not they have a more masculine or feminine audience, it's really sort of neutral. And I assume that in your content that you create and the other channels content that they create, that they're not targeting any one particular group with it. However, I think there are channels that do target men quite aggressively. And, it, and for me, they tend to be, and not just on YouTube, the channels that are much more about the gamification of money, mm -hmm. you know, how to you know make a lot of money with you know um, targeted investments in a short amount of time, and how to beat the market, and you know how to game real estate, and how to you know make a bunch of money by getting a job as like a data analyst on TaskRabbit that pays twenty dollars an hour, and then outsourcing it to someone in the Philippines for four dollars an hour. You know that kind of content, uh, as far as I can tell, um, seems to quite heavily target men, and I think. Um, for reasons I, I shared before about, you know, men um, and their financial prowess being such a strong kind of um, societal, uh, me you know, unit of measurement for them. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think, uh, you know, in, in my own realm, if you will, I think when it comes to stock picking, I think that kind of definitely appeals to that same, I you know, call it uh, drives, if you will. 
uh, you know, the whole uh, gamification of it is, is a good way to put it because it's the idea of, you know, uh, competing or, or uh, this, this challenge, if you will, that, uh, you know, if you watch this video, you'll be put ahead in that regard. Um, kind of pivoting uh, to, uh, as I mentioned, my own channel is kind of more investing focused. Uh, and I know that you kind of cover a wide range of topics, really anything that touches on money. Uh, but I was curious, uh, one of my early objectives with this podcast was to talk about uh, how different people view investing strategies and, and the kind of content they share with their audience on that. And I was just curious, uh, with the financial diet, what are kind of the, uh, whether it be a, it doesn't have to be like explicit stocks or ETFs or whatever, but do you have general investing principles that you try to share on your channel? Like what is your own approach to investing and what is the kind of stuff that you're sharing uh, to your audience about it? Yeah, um, you know, in terms of, you know, the sort of motif, I guess, probably we would hew most closely to like a John Bogle type method, um, mm. you know, in terms of, you know, very well diversified, consistent, you know, contributions, um, not trying to game the market, not trying to time the market, not doing anything fancy or frankly interesting. Um, you know, obviously prioritizing, uh, you know, the tax advantage retirement accounts. Um, and, you know, the only time there can be, I think, a little bit more of, you know, an art to it is when you're using investments for things like medium term savings. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but other than that, I mean, the something we really try to um, really try to drill into our audience is that most of what makes a person quote unquote good at investing is not only extremely boring and easy to do, but it's also going against basically all of human psychology. You know, mm. humans have a tendency to think that the more we like work on something, the more time we put into it, the more we're focused on it, the better the outcome will be. And in the case of investing, that's actually often the exact opposite of what is helpful. Mm. Um, and if, you know, people were able to predict the market, you know, they're, the market wouldn't function. Like it, that's the idea that people can predict it is kind of contrary to the entire idea of what makes the market as a whole function. Um, and as I think you mentioned in a recent in interview on our channel, the, uh, you know, the insider trading, the people who have a slight edge, like that's already baked into the market. Um, so trying to outperform the annual returns is most often a losing game. And we recommend that if you are going to do things like pick individual stocks, that it be with a very small amount of your portfolio and you don't do it for, you know, wealth building reasons, you do it because, you know, either you have an interest in it or you want to support those companies or, or whatever it might be. Sure. And you don't expect that to be you know your your strategy um luckily women like that i mean women just i think maybe one positive impact women on the board of funds could have is that they typically are more risk averse they're typically a little bit more conservative they don't need to be you know first past the post they don't need to um you know make huge splashes and big gains with these you know amazing picks so and overall, the market does reward that type of a strategy. And, you know, similarly to not, um, you know, trying to meddle with it too much, similarly, being able to turn, you know, turn your eyes away from a huge dip in the market, a years long crisis, whatever it might be, and not touch it and not get scared and not panic and not pull your money out. That's also against human psychology, but that's also probably the only really fundamental or one of the only fundamental things that people really have to train themselves to do is to do nothing. Mm. Yeah, the psychology around money is, is probably one of the most important steps for everyone to, to deal with and, and in terms of getting ahead because, you know, I, I think what you see a lot of, especially over the past few years, and I say this a lot, but the last few years have been very, um, they've really encouraged people to take that those riskier bets because we've seen, you know, the game stops and the AMC, you know, blow ups and, and cryptocurrencies and all this stuff that's really just blown up in value. And, and you know, p when you have the, the boring index investor over here earning 20%, but this guy made 2000% <laughs> in 30 days or whatever, you know, it, it brings a lot more attention to that area. But uh, you hit on a good point, like the, the psychological aspect of it is, is so important and probably the 
first part of, of the journey to, to getting ahead financially is uh, managing your emotions. You know, there have been plenty of studies that show that uh, the people who are, like you mentioned, willing or able to look away from the market and ignore uh, the fluctuations and not try to time the market, they tend to do better over the long term. So with your channel focusing on kind of that more passive approach, I'll call it, uh, do you find that you're seeing more uh, people online, given this kind of past few years, focusing, like pushing the other side of it? Like, do you see any resistance to that kind of strategy? Who are pushing against the sort of long and boring strategy? Yeah. Um, pushing against it, yes, in the sense that between things like crypto and, you know, the crazy individual stock picking and things like that, I think especially exacerbated by what is ultimately a very difficult economy for a lot of people, um, things like the pandemic, which gives people in many cases more time at home um, and maybe more instability in their primary income. Um, it's a it's a set of circumstances where people are more likely to say screw it and take some risks and want those big rewards and feel very you know, sort of frustrated at the reality of what it mostly takes for the vast majority of people to build wealth. Um, but that being said, you know, get rich quick stuff has is as old as money itself. There's sure, never, yeah. <laughs> I think, going to be a time when that's not appealing to people. And I, I think, again, you know, most people have an understanding of investment that I think is fundamentally predicated on people buying individual stocks. Um, mm -hmm. That's just the mental image we have. So I think a lot of people have to really work to get over that. Right. And when it comes to things like cryptocurrencies, what are kind of the uh, views, whether it be of the channel or yourself personally, that you have when it comes to managing money in cryptocurrency? I, personally, I've always tried to avoid talking too technical about cryptocurrencies on, on my channel, given that I'm more of a stock analyst. But uh, I'd be interested, you know, I, I've seen that you've covered it a couple times and so I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Well, I never speak on behalf of all of TFD because we're many, many voices <laughs> and even just amongst our own staff, I don't know everyone's opinion, but I can speak for myself and say that um, my feelings on cryptocurrency are that the term itself, cryptocurrency, I think is incredibly misleading and to some extent, probably intentionally so. Um, for something to be a currency, it has to be an incredibly stable, reliable, boring um, uh, sort of holder of value that, that an entire society can agree upon to replace us all having to like bring a bunch of oxen and corn and stuff around with us everywhere to barter. Um, and you know hold massive debts like we're not like we're not out here owing someone a hundred thousand chickens. Right. Um, <laughs> so like for currency to function, it needs to follow that uh, sort of, it needs to serve that purpose. But the vast majority of people, particularly lay people, and I think, you know, even in, in my own life, you know, my in-laws don't even speak English and they're out here like, tell me about this Ethereum. And I'm like, not you too, you know? <laughs> um, and when, when we're reaching people like that, and when people like that are thinking about it as a potential financial option for themselves and their future, they're thinking of it as an investment. They're mm -hmm. thinking of it as a way to sell as an asset that they can buy at a certain price and sell at a higher price. Yeah. So just based on that alone, it is not a functional currency in that respect. And similarly, as you know, we recently had um, Dan Olson of Folding Ideas on the channel who did, uh, I think, a mm -hmm. very seminal video about NFTs. Mm -hmm. um, so many of these um, currencies really follow a very specific model that it doesn't matter if you want to call it a pyramid scheme or you know a greater full scheme or a ponzi scheme or whatever you want to call it the the outcome of most of them is that in order for people to realize these gains that they were betting on when they bought in they have to find someone who will value it higher than them mm. and some people i think a lot of times what you come up against when you are critical of cryptocurrency is people being like, yeah, well, the, you know, the regular financial system sucks too. I agree. I have so many problems with it. Don't get me wrong. I don't think that it's a great system, but just because that system is flawed does not mean the system is better. And the idea that, you know, 
when you're convincing other people or sort of just, inf uh, you know, um, investing in the reputation or the perceived value of something, yes, to some extent, you can say that that's true of all currency and all, um, you know, the whole economy. But for example, when you compare it to investments, that's not really true because ultimately mm. what the value of a stock is based on is based on some sort of generated value or product or commodity yeah. or something that can be measured in something outside of just the value of that stock itself as a, as a concept. There are basically, there are not no use cases for cryptocurrency, but the ones that we have are so few and so heavily compromised that I just don't think it can really you know, sort of present itself as either a, a serious investment or as a currency. And in the meantime, our my advice to our audience is um, this is not something that at this time, and I know we're always talking about some imagined future where this will all be different and better. I'm, I, my, my mind is open, but as of now, this is not an opportunity to um, secure your financial future. It just isn't. Yeah, it's interesting how, uh when it comes to cryptocurrencies, a lot of the investment thesis, if you will, is based mm -hmm. on other people using it as a currency, but you yourself not being interested in that side of it. And I always found that kind right. of interesting, like especially here in North America, where you know we have functional currencies that uh, we don't have to worry about hyperinflation yet. <laughs> That's not uh, not, to, not to predict I'm that. I'm not but, being wood. Yeah. There's no wood in this condo. <laughs> but, but all to say that, you know, we have a functional monetary system. And, and yes, there are, of course, problems with that and, and huge issues that are deep rooted and difficult to tackle. Um, but I, I agree. I think that itself doesn't mean that this alternative is necessarily good. Um, and and I, I definitely like when it comes to currency too. you know, talking about it, being both an investment and a currency, you know, those two definitely conflict. Currencies themselves are, you don't necessarily want deflationary currencies or, or ones that grow in value. It makes for an incredibly volatile economy and makes it very difficult to run things functionally. Uh, whereas inflationary, uh, there are issues with that, of, of course. And generally speaking, you know, keeping something stable or boring, like you said, is, is the best middle ground, like the best place to be, uh, the sweet spot. So it's an interesting area. And I think too, you know, just recently we had um, with Russia and the sanctions coming with the Ukrainian invasion, uh, there was a bit of a, a pop in, in cryptocurrencies as people kind of saw this as a test case that, you know, we're finally going to see people trying to use cryptocurrencies as a safe haven, if you will. But I, I agree. I think the core thing when you talk to people about investing is, is like you said, like a business, when you invest in a stock or, or a company, you're buying something where business is making money. It's, it's growing its wealth that it's generating every year. When you buy a cryptocurrency, it's, it's speculating, like you said, on a greater fool or someone else buying it further down the road. It, well, it, it, if, if I could, sorry, just say one thing yeah, about the, so whether it's the, the convoy and what I, think is your your hometown where you are right now in Ottawa yeah they're, they're gone now <laughs> yeah oh, okay. the, the, the trucker convoy yeah we they were cleared well, out, uh, last weekend <laughs> so whether it's that or what is happening in Russia you know a lot of people I think use these examples like you're saying as uh, you know pointing to the importance of cryptocurrency as a way to get around this sort of thing and I've even seen people that I used to respect uh, saying things to that effect. <laughs> Listen, it's been a long, slow decline for some of these tech bros, but you fair, know, okay. <laughs> the, to, to be fair, I think, yeah, the, some of them really jumped the shark with the crypto stuff. But mm. a lot of people, I think, are using these examples of like, wow, look at, you know, uh, you know, sovereign nations can come in and seize funds or freeze accounts or, you know, stop your ability to access money or to transfer internationally or what have you. I think it's an incredibly naive understanding of what a currency needs to be in order to be a currency that you would think that whatever currency we're using in this future, for example, cryptocurrencies, that if it were at a place of being usable as a functional everyday currency, whatever governing bodies we have would not have that exact same level of influence and ability to cut it off and to disturb it and to disrupt it. Um, 
I, I think it's just very naive to imagine a scenario in which we have all of the you know benefits of a currency and none of and you know obviously the ability of a government to interfere with financial transactions is one example but on the flip side you know we've seen a lot of people get their crypto stolen and it seems like the general consensus right now is like well sorry buddy we didn't want any regulation and this is what that looks like you just are shit out of luck um you know we have you know, on the flip side of a government being able to step in and freeze an account is, you know, I recently had an issue with the bank that uh, holds my mortgage and I filed a complaint with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and they were on that bank's ass within like a week and the situation was resolved because, you know, the, the regulators held them to, uh, you know, account. Mm. Um, so the idea that you can get to a place of currency where it really truly functions as a societal level currency, but has neither any of the protection nor the oversight um, that we're talking about, I think is just in deeply naive. Yeah, it, it's interesting that on the topic, I'm actually uh, getting ready for a video on decentralized finance, which is kind of the side of, of you know, you mentioned a mortgage, kind of that side of, of finance, you know, it's not just sending money around, it's it's financial services, I guess. And and you, you see a lot of those issues, like especially consumer protections are virtually non-existent. And, and, you know, I can't really foresee in the near future someone getting a mortgage in crypto because, you know, you'd have to be kind of crazy to, to put that faith into the system as it currently exists. And, and I think, you know, everything is, is on the caveat of uh, depending on whether things change in the future. And no one can tell what the future will look like. But you know, as it currently stands, uh, it's a lot of speculation. It's a lot of people kind of guessing what the future will look like, uh, you know, guessing how other people will see value in it. And I, I have seen the argument quite a bit that, you know, sure, it's, it's not a currency. It's a store of value now, like that, that shift in, in, I guess, how people view Bitcoin and likewise other cryptocurrencies as gold 2.0 or, or whatever it is. Um, and it's just to say that, you know, it's still based on speculation. And I, I think for the individual, you know, it's a tough game to guess what other people will like 10 years from now, <laughs> you know, preferences change, people's views of what's valuable, what isn't changes. And, and uh, it's very tough to stay on top of that. You kind of spoke a little bit to uh, your thoughts on uh, certain YouTubers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd be curious. Uh, one thing I, I, I'm always, uh, I've been very critical of the finance YouTube space in the past. Um, and, you know, in a respectful way, like I, I truly don't want this to be seen as uh, me going after certain people or whatnot. But I just think when it comes to finance, you know, we talk about all the past things of, of cryptocurrencies, the focus on stock picking and stuff. It's really gone to a place where there's a lot of people who, uh, you know, are, are talking about how big their gains are. They're really pumping positions up and then kind of shoving all their mistakes under the rug and, and Kind of passing that responsibility onto viewers i'd be curious have you seen uh given that you've kind of been around youtube for a while have you seen a shift in what you're seeing on youtube in the finance space and what are your thoughts about finance youtubers as a whole i guess um you know at the end of the day i think we have always at tfd been outliers in the space even when the space was smaller because you know, we're very upfront about our progressive political values and our sort of general framework that, you know, money is ultimately like personal finance is, um, you know, no such thing is totally with or without personal responsibility. And obviously, as we manage our individual finances, there are enormous amounts of agency and daily choices that we get to make. But we're all ultimately making these choices within a very specific context that is policy based and, you know, regulation based and the, the lottery of birth and what class mobility looks like in your society and what, you know, maternity leave or unemployment laws or any of these things, you know, all of these things are a framework in which everyone is making their choices. And we're always very explicit that, you know, at the end of the day, not everyone will have the same opportunities. You know, even being in America compared to Canada, you guys are not a perfect society, but as it pertains to like a social safety net, you guys certainly are a few steps ahead of us in the US. Um, and that's always been our stance. And, you know, I mean, by the standards of like some personal finance YouTube, that makes us like 
communists, basically. <laughs> um, you know, we're full on tankies. Uh, but, you know, it is a very, it's a specific prism through which we, we look at money. And I think the, the space in YouTube and more generally in financial media has long been dominated by a much more libertarian view, a much more, you know, personal agency and responsibility is the beginning and the end of the sentence. Um, everyone can be a millionaire, which mm, fact check, no, they can't. Um, or, you know, the sort of the bootstraps narrative and this idea that it just all comes down to the choices that you make. And if you're poor, it's because you're stupid and you're lazy and you buy too many Xboxes or lattes or whatever. Um, and that is, I think, that has long been the point of view and the type of content that I think really prospers on YouTube. You know, I'm sure you've seen all those thumbnails of like, you know, guru reacts to like dumb girl who's like, you know, doing too much shopping or whatever, <laughs> the Kardashians or whatever. Right, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, that really low hanging fruit. And one thing that I will say kind of to the positive, especially kind of post COVID, I think where a lot of people who previously may have been in more secure circumstances suddenly found themselves, for example, without a job or very ill or losing a loved one. Um, I think there's been a little bit more of a reception to the idea, or they couldn't pay their student loans. You know, there's been a more of a reception to the idea that you can make a lot of right choices and still be in a in a really tough place through sure. no fault of your own. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have been seeing um, on YouTube and elsewhere the discourse. I think sort of move to a more holistic view of personal finance that includes the macro and includes policy and all of that stuff. Do you think YouTubers have moved away from that idea that you can kind of work your way out of everything, given that some people kind of proved that wrong with the pandemic happening and being spilt on the people? Or uh, do you think there's been a shift in the content because of, pandem of the pandemic? I mean, listen, the ones that are like sipping that Reaganomics Kool-Aid are <laughs> still going strong. They're sure, not going to yeah, yeah. change it well, for there's longer There's always, money. yeah, of course. There's always some people who are, who are, you know, you can will your way through anything in life. It doesn't matter, you know, if you've, uh, if <laughs> you're on your deathbed, you can make yourself a millionaire. <laughs> for sure. Um, so those people, I think, are still going strong and, and they'll always have an audience and they'll always have, you know, a place, but I think they're now no longer what I would perceive to be the the totality of the space. Like I feel like when we mm. came into the space, basically everyone was like Dave Ramsey or Susie Orman or the Rich Dad Poor G Dad book or whatever. Right. You know, it was like a very very specific narrative happening. Um, and now I feel like there's I think uh, much more of a diversity of thought. So that's encouraging. <laughs> that's one of the, the yeah. most encouraging takes I, I've had on this space. So that's good. Um, and I think, you know, to that point, obviously, uh, taking responsibility for your finances is important. But I, I, I like that point of, you know, recognizing and, and you see it with a, it's actually quite a, we talked about psychological factors earlier. That's actually quite a, a phenomenon is the externalization of, of certain factors, uh, sorry, the internalization of certain factors where you assume that you have more control than you do over things. And that's actually one of those human biases that makes people want to try and trade more short term and stuff like that. Um, so you, you kind of have your human mind working against you with that. But uh, when it comes to the idea of being able to work your way out of everything, you know, obviously the effort is, is a part of getting ahead financially. But recognizing the external factors is important too um, in that regard. And so that, that's encouraging to hear. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you know, some people are, are paying more heed to that, I guess. Um, I like to kind of pick people's brains towards the end of the conversation and just see if you have any tips you'd like to offer viewers. And I, I would suppose in the area of, you know, we talked about getting ahead financially. For someone who, let's say, is uh, whether it be fresh out of school, uh, starting their career, or just now trying to focus on their finances and just now kind of think, entering that kind of mindset of you know budgeting and things like that, do you have any tips that you would offer in terms of uh, what people can do to start off on the right foot? I think the most, the two biggest things. Sorry, I think there are three absolutely key factors that especially people who are starting off financially or starting over financially, because when I really started to take my finances seriously, I was post college, let's say, um, and I don't even have a degree. So, you know, <laughs> just like it was chaos for that first half of my 20s. But um, okay, yeah. 
but I think the you know if you're looking to really sort of get your stuff in order, um, the three kind of I think most important things are going to be number one. Um, you must track your finances, you must track your spending, you must understand what money you have coming in, what money you have going out. And this is not only something that you have to do even if you're not earning money or you're in debt or you're living on loans or whatever it might be, it's actually more important to do it at that time. I think a lot right. of people have a tendency to feel that they only need to start taking their money seriously once they have a bunch of it and that is the exact opposite mentality of what will help you. So. If you commit to nothing else, you don't even have to set a budget at first. Just start tracking. And mm. it is not only anecdotally, but you know, sociologically has been demonstrated that as people start to track these things, they will naturally start making better choices because they're constantly confronted with the consequences of their actions. One of my favorite phrases in life, what gets measured gets managed. Um, and it's very true. Uh, it's true of everything. Uh, the second thing is that ultimately your social life, especially as a young adult, your social life, your social circle will determine more about your finances than um, almost any other aspect of yeah. your life. Obviously, your job is going to be a big factor. Where you live city-wise is going to be a big factor. But those two things are often, you know, you're not playing with a million different choices in those cases. You often will get a job and you will live in a city where that job is or where you happen to, to settle down. Um, but the sort of big defining factor of a lot of our spending decisions is the context of our social lives. Are your friends constantly going out and spending a ton of money? Are you feeling like you have to keep up with them? Do you feel like you have to dress a certain way or, you know, go to certain places or go to trips or, you know, are you a bridesmaid a bunch, you know, for my audience that's always costing you a bunch of money, you know? Right. Do you feel that, do you feel that your friends are people that you can talk to about money? Do you feel that they help you make good decisions? Do you feel like you have a level of, you know, shared experience or accountability with them. All of these things I think are incredibly important to really confront yourself about because at least for me when I was having a ton of financial problems, they were either, you know, created or exacerbated by the social context that I was in where, mm -hmm. you know, talking about money was taboo, you know, people I was friends with people who had more money than I did, who spent it in ways that I couldn't afford to, and even if you're not spending to keep up with them, that is going to hugely damage your self-esteem, which can manifest in all kinds of, you know, negative ways sure. financially. So, right. making sure that you're in a social context that really supports your financial goals is extremely important. And then third and lastly is that the things that are going to be financially the smartest are going to be the things that take the least amount of work. Ultimately, yes, there are things like negotiation, which most people don't do, but everyone should. There are, you know, needing to move uh, to other organizations at your main job every few years in order to largely get those, you know, bigger raises and promotions. There are going to be, you know, times that you really have to cut back radically on spending in order to save. You know, there are times when action is really important and can make a big difference. That being said, the most most of the day-to-day -day stuff that's going to change your life financially are going to be things like automating your savings. They're going to be things like automating contributions. Mm. They're going to be things um, like setting up an app to you know hook on to your accounts so that you can track your budget and you know kind of get in the way of yourself. It's going to be you know moving things like your emergency fund to a different bank so that you don't even see it when you go to the ATM. You know. The things that are really important are going to be the things that don't involve your brain having to participate because mm. whether it's thinking that we can make, you know, better gains on an investment by messing around with it a bunch in the short term or we are moving our savings every month manually into our savings account which do not do that. You will find all kinds of reasons <laughs> not to do it or you'll forget sure. or you, yeah. you'll feel sad about it. Um, your brain is often your enemy when it comes to financial management. So mm. that's it. Yeah, I, uh, I don't remember where I got this from, but habit over motivation is really powerful with finance. You know, the idea, yes. I, I think a lot of people, they assume at one point they'll be motivated to, to do it. You know, they'll be inspired to change their life and, and change things around. From the sounds of it, kind of like what you did, you know, that, that, that total turnaround story. But most of the time, you know, if you can utilize habits and, and get into the habit of stuff, that's really how, you know, when it comes to automatic savings, uh, tracking, budgeting, and stuff like that, that's really what's going to be the easiest route to getting ahead um, in terms of managing your finances. Chelsea, thank you for uh, taking the time to talk with, uh, talk with us today. It was a very insightful conversation. I appreciate uh, all the thoughts you had to offer and you kind of dealing with all the sporadic ideas I want to talk about today. <laughs> 
It was great to be here, and thank you for coming on our show. You guys should yeah, watch that too. Of course, and yes, let me uh, point that out. So. Uh, of course, you guys can check out the Financial Diet YouTube channel. I will actually be on that YouTube channel doing Chelsea's podcast. Uh, it was this interesting thing where I asked her to come on my podcast and she decided to beat me to it and have me on hers first. Uh, so if you'd like to hear me talk for another hour, now you can go to uh, the Financial Diet, check that out. Also, their website, uh, plenty of articles on there, their blog, their newsletter, plenty of uh, routes that you can consume the Financial Diet, if you will. Uh, no pun intended there. Chelsea, <laughs> thank you for joining me. And guys, thank you for watching us today. See you in the next one. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.